Let's stand and uh, let's greet everybody around us. Most of you are our extended family visiting from other areas. Say hello. Tell them it's great to see them. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord hath made, that the Lord hath made. I will rejoice, I will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord hath made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. Ah, wonderful. Be seated. It's so good to see everybody here this morning and all these smiling faces. I got to meet several of you, not everybody, but we got people from all over the country like we normally do. And uh, just as our local members here, we bless each other by being here and reminding each other that no matter where we are, what we're doing, or who we're seeing, there's always time for God. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> Before we have the opening prayer, we're going to sing Anywhere with Jesus, number 48 in the hymnal. Number 48 in the hymnal. Matthew 8, 23 through 26. He rebuked the waves, and it was calm. <clears throat> Let us sing this song. <clears throat> Excuse me. Anywhere with Jesus, I can safely go. In this world below, anywhere without Him, here joys would fade. Anywhere with Jesus, I am not afraid. Anywhere, anywhere, fear I could not know. Anywhere with Jesus I could say we go. Anywhere with Jesus I am not alone. Other friends may fail me, he is still my own. Though his hand may lead me over dear way. Yeah. 
anywhere, anywhere, fear I cannot know. Anywhere with Jesus I can safely go. Anywhere with Jesus over land and sea, telling souls in darkness of salvation free. Ready as he summons me to go or stay. Anywhere with Jesus when he points the way. Anywhere, anywhere, fear I cannot know. Anywhere with Jesus I can say, please. Anywhere with Jesus I can go to sleep In the darkening shadows round about me creep Knowing I shall weep for more to roam Anywhere with Jesus will be home sweet home Anywhere where fear I cannot know. Anywhere with Jesus I can say, please Good morning. Let us bow. Our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for another beautiful day and an opportunity to come together to sing praises to your name, to learn about your word, to worship you, to share in the thing that is Christianity. Lord, we ask that you keep Kenny Jones in heart and in mind. Help him, strengthen him during his trials. We ask you to be with the others that are sick in this congregation and the others that are visitors and their home congregations. Give them the strength that they need. Dear Lord, we ask that you be with Dale as he leads us in worship today, brings us a word that will touch our hearts and our minds so that we may be able to follow in your word. We thank you, Lord, for all the many, many blessings that you've bestowed on us, the beautiful mountains that you've given us, and the earth that we have. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Brother Dale is going to be giving us our lesson here shortly. I know the last couple of months, probably for Dale and Paula, has been kind of a whirlwind. But uh, last week they finally got moved here. So they actually live in Sevierville, and it's wonderful to have them. Dale Babinski, he was a dean of students at the uh, preacher school in Knoxville. It's so good to have him and Paula here. We look forward to a long relationship and to lift this church up. So, <clears throat> excuse me. It is so wonderful to see everybody. It looks like we're finally starting to get our pews filled up again. So it's been a while, but what a blessing. So it's wonderful to have you. Let us stand and sing this song before our lesson this morning, if you're able. It's number 129 in our hymnal, number 129, Psalm 37, 23 through 24. It says, though he stumble, he will not fail. Amen? Amen. Here we go. Each step I take, my Savior goes before me, and with his loving hand he leads the way. And with each breath I whisper, I adore thee. Oh, what joy to walk with him each day. Each step I take, I know that he will guide me to higher I 
times I feel my faith begin to waver when up ahead I see a chasm wide. It's then I turn and look up to my Savior. I am strong when He is by my side. Each step I take, I know. Trust in God, no matter what may, for life eternal is in His hand. He holds the key that opens up the way that will lead the promise. Until someday the last step will be taken, each step I take just leads me closer home. Be seated. Good morning. Good to see you all here this morning. It's a lovely uh, Lord's Day and pleased that uh, you could all be out with us. It's uh, great to see so many of you here. Uh, I know some of us are uh, on the road this week and uh, Mark and Kathy are, are out of town and so pray for them as they travel. Pray, pray for, for Kathy uh, Haynes. Uh, she's having issues with her eyesight in her right eye and uh, she, she needs our prayers uh, in that, that the Lord's hand will be uh, in that for her. Uh, pray for um, Jacob and Aslan. They are traveling uh, this week. They're on vacation. And so pray for them that they'll have safe travels to get back to us. But it's great to see everybody here. It's great to see the Valentines out with us. Uh, I was able to get to meet them. And uh, so uh, make sure to, to say hello to them if you haven't seen them in a little while. Uh, they, are, they are able to be out with us today uh, rather than being shut in where they normally would be. And so we're, we're happy that they are, they are here with us uh, today. It was a normal Sunday morning, and uh, Jack was an elder in the church, and so he had driven over. They had a meeting that morning at the church building, and so he had driven over by himself. And later, Ruby and the, and the kids came over to church, and, and they worshiped that Sunday morning. And when it got time to go home, some of the kids went home with Jack, and some of the kids went home with Ruby. But the baby, uh, she didn't go home with anybody. Uh, she stayed back at the church building. And they got home and didn't realize uh, that uh, she was missing yet. They, they both assumed that she was riding with the other parent. And so they get home and they start, you know, corralling the kids and getting ready for lunch. And they start counting the heads and they start counting mouths to feed. And lo and behold, the, the baby isn't, the youngest child, she's, she's not there. She wasn't back home with them. And so they get on the phone and they start calling their relatives. Did she go home with you? Did she go home with you? They start calling their friends. Did, and they, they shortly begin to realize that, no, she didn't go home with anybody else, that they're going to have to turn around and go back to the church building because they left her behind at the church building and that's where they found her. That's where she was. Now, I reckon that Jack and Ruby probably aren't uh, the, the last folks that have 
uh, left a child at the church building and had to go back and get them. I, I reckon they're not the first either because guess what? This exact same thing happened to Mary and Joseph when Jesus was 12 years old, that he was left behind, if you will, uh, at the temple. And we read about that in Luke chapter 2, uh, verses 41 through 50. And so if you've got your sword with you this morning, uh, I, uh, join, uh, I invite you to join me uh, over there in Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 41. Um, It says, his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. When they had finished the days as they returned, the boy Jesus lingered behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother did not know it. But supposing him to have been in the company, they went a day's journey and sought him among their relatives and acquaintances. So when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem seeking him. Now so it was that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were astonished, right? All who heard him were astonished at his understanding and his answers. So when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said to him, son, why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. And he said to them, why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? But they did not understand the statement which he spoke to them. Jesus was left behind here at the temple. He was 12 years old. And Joseph and Mary, not knowing what was going on, not knowing what had happened, assumed that he was there with them. And they got a day's journey. They traveled a day's journey, if you will, without Jesus. And I want us to think about that, that when we travel through life, wherever it is that we go, if we're on vacation, maybe we come to the Great Smoky Mountains or maybe we're traveling back home, wherever it is that we go in our daily lives, whether we're going to work or going to school, are we taking Jesus with us? Or are we making a day's journey without Jesus? Because we need to take Jesus with us wherever we go. As Brian sang this morning, I can go anywhere, right? Anywhere with Jesus, I can safely go. Well, they went a day's journey without Jesus. Why? What happened to them? Well, they were busy, right? And sometimes life uh, is busy and we lose track of the things that are most important to us. We get caught in the hustle and bustle of our daily lives and we lose sight sometimes uh, of the details. Well, what was going on here with Mary and Joseph? That they had come to Jerusalem, right? The text says that they had come to Jerusalem uh, for the feast of the Passover. And notice in verse 43, it says, when they had finished the days. Uh, with Passover, with the feast of Passover, you would have the seven day period that was known as the days of unleavened bread. Because they came out of Egypt in haste, because they were in a hurry, they didn't have time to uh, put the, the uh, leaven in the dough, right, in order to make their bread. So what they took with them was unleavened bread. And what they ate was unleavened bread. And that was what they had in their journey as they started out of the land of Egypt. And so as a reminder of them leaving Egypt, as a reminder of them making that exodus from Egypt, well, at the Passover, when they remember God passing over them and killing off the male first, uh, firstborns uh, in Egypt, that they would uh, have this unleavened bread. And so they would have these seven days of unleavened bread. So they're here in Jerusalem. Now, traveling from where they lived to Jerusalem would be a, a task. They didn't just, you know, pack up the minivan and, and put, you know, some ice water in the cooler and head on down the road. There was a lot that was involved in preparing to travel back and forth. They may have had other kids to wrangle, right? We know that Jesus was the oldest child that they had, and he's 12 years old at this time. But when we read over in, I think it's Matthew chapter 13, we find that Jesus has four brothers and at least two sisters. And so there may have been some other kids to wrangle and to get them going. And this caravan would have acquaintances. It would have other relatives. It would be other folks that had come from the same area of Israel that had come to Jerusalem for this feast. And now they're heading back home. And so you got all this busyness going on. And uh, in, the, in the shuffle of all of that, they lose track of where Jesus is. But what was it that was important to Joseph and Mary? What was important to them was keeping God's law. Notice the text tells us that his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. 
This was something where they were required to go, at least the men were required to go, but this was an annual thing. And in Exodus chapter 12, in verse 15, we see with regards to these days of unleavened bread, it says, seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall remove leaven from your houses, for whoever eats leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel, right? And so these days of unleavened bread, observing this and keeping this was part of the Mosaic law. Now there were, boy, there were a lot of things in the Mosaic law to keep track of. There were a lot of things in the Mosaic law to, to perform as far as rituals. And so you've got all of this ritual and all of this tradition and all of these things that are given in the Mosaic law and it's a lot to keep track of, right? And sometimes you might um, not remember to do something or you might not keep your eye on everything that's going on. And there's a lot of times that we do the same thing, that we get busy in our daily lives, we've got a lot of things that are going on and maybe we lose track of that which is most important to us or that which should be most important to us. Sometimes we gotta stop and look around us there are lost souls that are out here in this world that need us to talk to them, that need us to teach them, that need us to maybe reach out a, a helping hand to get them back on track with God. There are brethren that are out there who have wandered away that are lost, that we need to go and, and do something about that. What was it that was important to them? Well, keeping the law, coming to Jerusalem in order to keep the law, to observe the law. Over in Deuteronomy, chapter 16 and verse 1, they are told to, to, with regards to the Passover that they were to keep this. They were to keep the Passover every year, every year after year after year after year. They were to keep the Passover. It was on a regular schedule. Well, you know, we just celebrated the Passover last year. Can we skip it this year? We've been celebrating the Passover for 10 straight years. Can we skip it this year? No, it was a requirement under the Mosaic law that they do that. We just worshiped God last week. Do we have to come worship God again this week? Yes. We do it again and again, right? What is it that's important to us is being with the Lord. In Deuteronomy 16.1, it says, Observe the month of Abib, Abib and keep the Passover to the Lord your God. For in the month of Abib, Abib, the Lord your God brought you out of Egypt by night. And so they are to keep this remembrance, much in the same way that we keep the Lord's Supper, to remember what it is that Jesus has done for us. They were to keep this Passover meal, to remember what God had done for them, that he had saved them, right? That they had been redeemed uh, while they were there in Egypt. If you skip down in Deuteronomy chapter 16 to verse 16, the law there says, three times a year all your males shall appear before the Lord your God in the place which he chooses, at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, at the Feast of Weeks, and at the Feast of Tabernacles, and they shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed. And so what was it that they were required to do? Well, they were required to travel to Jerusalem. The men had to travel to Jerusalem at least three times a year, and one of those was that Feast of Unleavened Bread. That was a requirement, and they were not to come empty-handed. They were to bring whatever they were going to sacrifice right? And so just think about the logistics of all of that. I I'm, I'm used to work in manufacturing for 20 years. I was used to dealing with logistics. Uh, moving here last week, uh, I had a lot of logistics to figure what's going on, which truck and which one the, the, the movers are taking because that's too heavy for us to carry and trying to figure out where we're going to put everything now in the new house. Um, there's a lot of logistics that are involved. Well, you've got a lot of logistics here when you're traveling to Jerusalem from wherever you live and you're bringing all of these things with you so that you're prepared when you get there. And so they had all this to get packed up to move from Jerusalem back. It says that they are to appear three times a year where the Lord was gonna to choose to place his name. Well, it turned out that was Jerusalem. When David conducted a census of the people and there was a plague, he was told to build an altar at the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. You read about that uh, at the end of uh, First Kings or no, sorry, at the end of 2 Samuel, you read about that at the end of 2 Samuel, that he, he, there was this plague and that he had to build an altar at the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. And that was the place in Jerusalem that God chose to place his name. That was the place where Solomon was gonna build the temple. First Chronicles, or 2 Chronicles chapter three, I think that is, uh, in verse one, that that's where Solomon built the temple, right? And so God chose to place his name there. That's where they had to go. Now they've gotta travel back home but they lost sight of Jesus. 
and all the hustle and bustle of what was going on. Do we sometimes get caught up in all the things that are going on in our life? We've got to take junior to soccer practice, uh, or we've got band practice, or we've got this going on or that going on, or we're going to see the choir. Maybe we have some sort of sporting event. Maybe we have a vacation to plan. We've got all these things that are going on. Do we remember to take Jesus with us? Or do we travel a day's journey without Jesus sometimes? What is it that should be the most important thing to us? Do we treat Sunday night the same way that we treat Sunday morning? Is it still important to us that it's the Lord's day? Is God's law as important to us from Monday through Saturday as it is on Sunday? Or are we just going to be Christians for an hour and a half and then we're going to go back to doing whatever it is that we do? Is What is it that is important to us? Are the things of the world more important to us than serving the Lord? We need to bring Jesus with us wherever we go. Sometimes we may lose track of things, right? And they make these little devices now. They got these little mirrors that you can put up so that you can look in the back seat and you can see that your child is there in the back seat and you can make sure that they're, they're there and everything's okay and, and nothing's a problem. It amazes me that I hear stories from time to time throughout the year that people leave their child in the back seat of the car in a hot car and they go in to do something because they forget that they've got the child with them. We tend to sometimes forget things. I'll, I'll daydream when I'm driving. I don't realize how I got where I'm at, but I, somehow I'm on autopilot, I guess. And I just, I got to the place where I got to, but I wasn't thinking about where I was driving to. We can do that. We can get lost uh, in the moment. And so if we have a child in the back seat, occasionally we need to look back there and make sure that they're still there and that they're still okay. Well, what about our brothers and sisters in the church? Do we look around and see who's there and who's not there, who, who's been attending, who hasn't been attending, if somebody's been missing? There, there was a time where uh, I was preaching at different places, being the dean of students, and so I wasn't at Carnes uh, on a particular morning, and the next week I was, I was ill, and the next week I was preaching someplace else. And it, so it had been almost a month since I had been there, and I showed up on Sunday morning, and one of the members came up to me and said, hey, I haven't seen you here in several weeks. Is everything going okay with you? I was grateful that they came and asked me if I was okay, if things were all right with me, because they noticed that I wasn't there. It may just be the people that we sit around. Maybe the congregation or the building is so big that we don't, we don't get to see everybody on every Sunday, but at least the folks that are sitting around us, do we notice that they're there or not? Do we notice that they're missing? Because should our brothers and sisters in Christ be important to us? They ought to be important to us, right? They're our family. Why should, is it that we attend worship in the first place? Well, there's two reasons. We attend worship so that we can worship God, right? And so we lift up our voices and we praise him in songs and we pray to him. We remember him in the sacrifice that he made in the Lord's Supper. And so we offer that praise upward to God. But we also edify and strengthen and build one another up. The Hebrews writer in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 24 says, Let us consider one another, to stir up love and good works. Let us consider one another. When we don't attend and we don't strengthen and edify one another, we're not considering our brethren. We're considering the world as being more important than our brethren. We're considering the world to be more important than worshiping our and praising our God. And we need to keep our eyes on that which is most important. Sometimes like Joseph and Mary, they made the assumption that everything was okay. They just kind of assumed that Jesus was somewhere else in the caravan, that he was somewhere else with, with the, the people that were traveling with them. Jack and Ruby, right, each assumed that the, the child uh, was with the other parent. And they made assumptions. And sometimes we make assumptions as well. Are we making assumptions as we journey without Jesus that, well, everything's okay, I'm, I'm basically an okay person, I'm better than those people that are over there. Realize that the other people that are over there, that is not the standard to compare ourselves to, right? The standard to compare ourselves to is what it is that God has told us to do. What is it that's in God's law? Right? And so sometimes we make assumptions when we're traveling without Jesus and we tell ourselves, well, everything is okay, or I'll get to that later. 
We're, we're starting to unpack boxes in the house and put things away. And my, my wife uh, doesn't have as much as I do uh, as far as stuff goes. And um, she's not as much of a collector, I guess, as I am. And so she's got all of her things unpacked and put away. Well, I'm still, uh, I'm still working on that, right? And so I've got the, the garage that I'm saving for last because I'm trying to get the house settled first, right? And so there are things that sometimes we put off till later. But we can't put off the most important things till later because the later may not come that time might not come. If I don't get the garage all organized the way that I want it to, well, it'll still, the stuff's still out there. It's not going anywhere, right? No one's gonna come arrange it for me. It's still gonna be there when I get to it. But I don't know that I've got tomorrow to be with the Lord. I gotta make sure I'm with the Lord today. I gotta make sure I'm traveling with Jesus today. And so I can't make an assumption that, well, I'll just get that to that later or that I'm too busy right now. We pack our lives full of so many things that we don't have time for. You know, we make time for the things that are important to us. We need to make time for God. We need to make time for Jesus. Well, at some point, they're traveling along, and, and the realization sets in that Jesus isn't here, right? He's, he's not with us. He's not with the rest of the, the company, right? And so they, they, they've got this realization that uh, this has taken place. They supposed them to have been in the company. They went a day's journey. They sought him among their relatives and their acquaintances. So when they didn't find him, they returned to Jerusalem seeking him. Now, so it was that after three days, they found him in the temple. Now, whether it's three days total, they traveled a day's journey, and it took them two days to get back, or it took them three days to get back. Notice, they've journeyed a whole day away from Jerusalem, but it takes them longer to get back. Why? They're not in a hurry to get back to Jerusalem. They're looking for Jesus. They're seeking for him everywhere that they go on the way back, because they're not sure where he is. They don't know where he is. And so they're, they're diligently seeking for him. Right? We would call our relatives, like Jack and Ruby did, and say, did the girl go home with you? Is she with you? We need to realize whether or not we're traveling with Jesus. And the only way that we can make that realization is we've got to do a self-evaluation. We have to compare ourselves to that standard to see, am I traveling with Jesus or have I gone a day's journey or maybe a week's journey or maybe a month's journey without Jesus? In 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5, Paul says, Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you are disqualified? We don't want to be Christians in name only. We don't want to call ourselves something that we aren't really living up to that, right? We don't want to be disqualified. We need to examine ourselves to see. We can check and see whether or not we're living in accordance with God's word, can we not? We can see here's what God's word says to do, and then we can compare that to what it is that we are doing. We can make an honest assessment of where it is that we are and make that realization if we're not traveling with Jesus, then we need to get back to him because there's no other way that we're going to be saved. There's no, no, nobody else that's going to come and die for us. There's nobody else that we can pray to. There's no one else that we can appeal to. We can't lift ourselves up by our own bootstraps and save ourselves. We have to have Jesus. We must be traveling with Jesus. In Acts chapter 4, as Peter is answering the charges there in verse 11 and 12, he tells them, this is the stone, right, in reference to Jesus. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. There's no other way to be saved than to go through Jesus. John chapter 14 and verse 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. If you were here a few weeks ago, when we, we, uh, on Wednesday night, we studied John chapter 10. Right? And Jesus said, I am the door. If anyone wants to come in and find safety or go out and find good pasture, they got to come through me. They got to go through the door. They got to go through Jesus. And so we've got to have him. We need to realize if we're traveling through life without Jesus that we need to turn around and go back. Mary and Joseph, when they realized they were traveling without Jesus, they turned around and they retraced their steps and they went back to go find him. We need to realize we need Jesus because we can't make it on our own. Worked for the preaching school for seven years, and the students who come to preaching school, they, they need to raise funds in order for their living expenses. The school is very intense. They can't work a job while they're going to school. And so they, they can't do it 
on their own. They need to raise that support. We can't do it on our own. We can't pay the debt that we owe for our sins because the wages of our sin is death. There's nothing that we have. There's nothing that we can do that's going to overcome what it is that we owe. Only Jesus was able to pay that debt for us. And so we need to turn back and we need to go and we need to seek for him and we need to look for him. When Paul was on Mars Hill and he's speaking to the Athenians in Acts chapter 17, he tells them this. He says in verse 27 that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of our own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. We are to seek for him, right? Grope for him. Think about when you get up in the middle of the night and it's dark and you don't want to turn the light on and wake your spouse up. And so you're, you're kind of groping in the dark, right? You're kind of feeling your way to make sure you don't bump. You know where everything is. Are we doing that as we search for God? Are we checking every nook and cranny to see if we can, if we can find him? Are we making sure that we're on the right path that we're, we're seeking for him? God wants us to find him, right? Notice Paul says that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might find him. He is not far from each of us. God is there. He's within reaching distance if we would grope for him. He's not far. God's not playing hide and seek. Right? He's not trying to see if he, can, if he can win the game and have us not find him. Ha, huh, I'm over here. Our, our, our daughter was real good when she was a young child to play in hide and seek. She understood the rules of the game was to not be found if she wanted to win. And so she hid herself so good that we couldn't find her. We're, we're calling for her. We're searching around the outside of the house, checking everywhere for her. She wouldn't come out because she knew that if she came out, she, would lose. she wanted to win the game. Right? Well, God's not doing that. He's not playing hide and seek in that way. If we will seek for him, if we're diligent in seeking for him, uh, we will find him. Because we turn around and we go back for the things that are important to us, don't we? How many times have you turned around and gone back to your house because you forgot this? Or you left it behind, right? We turn around and we go back for this. How many times have you turned around and gone back to your house because you forgot to bring your Bible? Which of these two things is more important to us and which ought to be more important to us? Now, I understand a lot of folks, they have their Bible on their phone, so if you've got one, you've got the other. But what is it that we prioritize? What is it that we find to be the most important thing uh, to us? Jesus should be an integral part of our daily lives, not just on Sunday. We should take Jesus with us every day. There should never be a day's journey that we make without Jesus. Because we don't put Jesus on in baptism, right? We don't put him on in baptism and then go home and say, well, got to take that off and go back to what it was that I was doing. We put Jesus on in baptism and we need to keep him on. It's not like this suit. When I get home, I'm going to take this suit off, right? We need to keep Jesus on and need to keep Jesus with us all the time. Jesus told a parable about a wedding feast. And in this wedding feast, there was a guest who didn't have on the wedding garment. And they come and they see him, and he doesn't have a wedding garment. And they want to know, what is he doing there? And so they, they kick him out of the wedding, right? And they say they, they cast him out where there's darkness and weeping and gnashing of teeth, talking about he's cast out of the wedding feast, basically cast into hell. And we think, man, that's hard. Guy didn't wear the right clothes to the wedding, and they're going to throw him out? Does that mean if I don't wear a suit and tie to church on Sunday, I'm going to get kicked out of the church, right? Because I don't have my, the right garments on. What's that all about? Well, if you understand first century weddings, when you came in the door, right, when you came in the proper way, whoever was hosting that wedding would give you that wedding garment. And so there'd be no need for somebody to be in the wedding feast to not have their wedding garment on because you got it when you came in the door. The only person in that wedding feast that doesn't have a garment on, well, they're a wedding crasher. There aren't going to be any wedding crashers in heaven. You've got to go through the right entrance to get in there. And that entrance is Jesus. We've got to keep Jesus on and keep Jesus with us all the time. As part of that, we need to do what it is that Jesus came to do. Jesus came to seek and save those that were lost. Those that had never heard the gospel, maybe. Those uh, who um, were destitutes, maybe those that were uh, in, engaged in lives of sin. Jesus spent time with them and he talked to them and he spoke to them and he came to seek and save those who were lost. Is that our mission? Do we share that same mission with Jesus? Because we need to seek and save the lost, not just those who have never heard the gospel, but those who have fallen away. We need to give care to our brethren. 
We have this treasure now in earthen vessels. That's what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 7. God's not going to speak to people directly. The Holy Spirit's not going to whisper in their ear. He's not going to tap them on the shoulder, tell them to come back to church. It's going to be up to us to do that. It's going to be up to us, this treasure that is now in earthen vessels, to do that. It's up to the church, he says in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 10. It's up to the church to make the manifold wisdom of God known. Manifold. If, if you've worked on a car, you know what a manifold is. But for, for you ladies, it's multifaceted. It's multidimensional, right? The wisdom of God, there's a lot to it. And who's going to make that known to the world? He says it's the responsibility of the church, right? It's our responsibility to make that known. Jesus said, you know, why is it that you have sought for me? And, and Mary said, why have you done this to us? We have sought you anxiously. I imagine Jack and Ruby were pretty anxious not knowing where their daughter was and trying to locate her and find where she was to go back to the church building and get her. You can see that Mary and Joseph were anxious as they were seeking for two or three days to find Jesus again, to see where it was that he was. When we notice, when we make that realization that we have gone a day's journey without Jesus, is there any anxiety there? Is it a big deal to us that we've gone a day or a week or a month without Jesus? Or does it not bother us anymore? I think COVID-19 helped us to get into some bad habits with regards to sitting at home in our pajamas and watching church on TV. And maybe it's a little harder for us, but we need to get back at it, brethren. We need to get back at it. We need to be about our Father's business. There should be some anxiety if we're traveling without Jesus. There was on the part of Joseph and Mary. Jesus said, why were you surprised? I must be about my father's business. Now, when, when Jesus talked about being about his father's business, I think sometimes they thought about the carpentry business. And that's not what Jesus was talking about. He wasn't talking about his carpentry business. But when Jesus would speak to them and they would hear these things and they were amazed by his teaching, they would bring up the fact that he was the son of a carpenter. In Luke chapter 4 and verse 21, Jesus read from the Isaiah scroll that day in the synagogue and he sat down and he said, this day, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And it says, so all who bore witness to him and marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth and said, is this not Joseph's son? Isn't this Joseph's son? Isn't this the carpenter's son? And so when he talks about his father's business, well, he's not talking about the carpentry business. He's talking about his heavenly father's business. In John chapter 5 and verse 17, Jesus answered them, My father has been working until now, and I have been working. If you were here for a Bible class this morning, we were talking about the angel of the Lord that appeared to Moses in a burning bush. That that's Jesus, basically, that he's been working. He didn't start his work when he was born of Mary and came to earth. He's been working all this time. And the Heavenly Father's been working all of this time. And he's got work to do. He needs to be about his Father's business. He's got work to do while, it, while he can do it. In John chapter 9 and verse 4, Jesus said, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day, for the night is coming in which no one can work. Got a limited amount of time while we're in this life that we can do the work that God has placed before us because there's coming a time when we're not going to be able to work anymore. The night's going to come when we're going to sleep. We're not going to have a chance then to do the work that we need to do. There are things that we need to do in order to have God's grace. We can't earn our salvation, but there are things that God has given us to do. We need to do those while we can. His parents were astonished at his teaching. And those that heard him there in the temple for those two or three days, they were astonished at his teaching. They were astonished at his, at his answers and his understanding. And that was a typical response that Jesus had to his teaching. You know, in all the miracles that Jesus performed, most of the time, they weren't astonished by the amazing things that he did. But they were astonished and amazed by the things that he said. In Matthew chapter 7 and verse 28, when he finished the Sermon on the Mount, it said that they, when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his teaching. Why? Because he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes and the Pharisees. They were astonished at his teaching. In Mark chapter 11 and verse 18, 
the text says, and the scribes and the chief priests heard it and sought how they might destroy him, for they feared him because all the people were astonished at his teaching. When, when Jesus taught, he built his popularity. People were interested. They were astonished at his teaching. He doesn't teach like these other guys. They wanted to hear more about what it was that he said. And as his popularity grew, those chief, chief priests and scribes and Pharisees, their jealousy of him continued to grow and grow and grow until they wanted to put him to death. And so Jesus said, I, I must be about my father's business. Mary and Joseph didn't understand it. Imagine if you had a child that stayed behind and it's three days later when you find him and you say, what are you doing here? Don't you understand how anxious you made us? Why didn't you stay with the rest of the group? And he says, well, I gotta be here to do my father's business. You say, what are you talking about? <laughs> right, get in the car, we're going, right? We, would we accept that as an answer? Well, you know, Jesus obviously was, was something different. And we need to be about our father's business. Jesus, when he was at the, the well with the Samaritan woman, and he spoke to her, and the disciples had gone off to find food and water. And when they came back after finding food, Jesus didn't eat. And they said, well, did somebody else feed him? You know, how come he's not hungry? And Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Jesus had a task before him to do. And that was what he did. If we're going to travel with Jesus, if we're going to journey with Jesus, we need to do the same thing that he did. We must be about our father's business uh, also. And in being our father's business, as we mentioned earlier, uh, we need to be involved in, in seeking and saving the lost, right? Whether that's folks that have never heard the gospel or folks who have fallen away. We've got to be involved in that. We've got to take a role in that. We are to be the light and the salt of the earth. Right? The light is kind of a, a guides us to the direction that we should go. Salt has a preserving power, right? It adds flavor to things. And so we've got to be that pres preservation, right? We've got to help to preserve uh, the, the world by teaching Christianity, by teaching about Jesus, by teaching the gospel. We've got to help to preserve as much as we can. Because at the end of the day, I think it really doesn't matter who it is that we vote for. We're not going to solve the problems of this country. We're not going to solve the problem, problems of this world at the ballot box. We're going to solve the problems of this world by converting people to Christ, by being light and salt, as he's told us to do. And then the ballot box will take care of itself. We are to admonish and encourage each other. In Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 13, he says, While it is still called today, Right to exhort one another, to encourage one another, so that none of us are hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. You got somebody that's lost in a trespass, encourage them, admonish them, exhort them. Do it while it is still today, right? And in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 24, that we are to consider one another to stir up love and good works. Well, I can't stir you up to love and good works if I'm not here. We are to encourage one another and so much the more as we see the day approaching. We are to preach the gospel to the lost, right? Make disciples of the nations, baptizing them and teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. We are to preach the gospel to every creature, Mark chapter 16 and verse 15. If we're going to be about the Lord's business, we need to be about the Father's business. We are to bring back the erring. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1, if any among you uh, wanders away, right, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in meekness and gentleness, right, taking care so that you don't fall, so that you aren't tempted, and let us bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. We are to bring back those who are erring. In James chapter 5, he says, if you bring back someone who is erring, you will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. It's the Lord's business, it's the Father's business for us to bring back those who have fallen away. We are to do good to all. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 10 says, let us as we have opportunity do good to all men and especially to those of the household of faith. Those of the household of faith, that would be our fellow Christians. All men would be everybody else. Let us do good to all men as we have opportunity. Not repaying evil for evil, but repaying evil for good. Romans chapter 12, verses 17 and 18. Father's got a lot of work for us to do. We need to make sure that as we journey through life, that we haven't gone a day's journey without Jesus. Are we being like Mary and Joseph, traveling without Jesus? If we are, we need to turn around, we need to fix that. 
Do we have a like concern to retrace our steps and get back to where he is? He doesn't move. If we're not with Jesus, it's because we've moved. It's because we've wandered away. Do we have a concern for our lost soul if we're not journeying with him? Maybe we've gone from time to time a day's journey without Jesus. Maybe we've gone weeks at a time without Jesus. Maybe we've gone months at a time without Jesus. Maybe we know others that are journeying without Jesus. Do we have a concern for their souls? If we aren't with Jesus, then we're not going to be with him for eternity. If we're not with him now, we're not going to be with him for eternity. We've got to make that choice. We've got to make that decision to journey with Jesus, to take him with us wherever it is that we go, to obey what it is that he says in his gospel, to put Christ on and to never take him off. Because on Judgment Day, we're going to want Jesus to be with us. We're going to want to make sure that he's in our company on Judgment Day. We need to make sure that he's with us now. If he's not with you now because you've never been baptized for the remission of your sins, we'd be happy to baptize you this morning before you leave here. If you've heard the words of the gospel and you believe it to be true, you're willing to, to make a change and to, to come back to him if you've wandered away or you've not come to him in the first place, if you're willing to confess him before men that you believe that he's the Son of God, you can be baptized for the remission of your sins and you can walk out of here saved. Maybe you've done that, but you've been journeying without Jesus and you need to come home. Well, we'll welcome you home. We'll pray with you. We'll pray for you. Make your need known by coming to the front now as we join with our brother and as we sing. gather around the table and humble ourselves before God. We're going to sing Heaven Came Down. Number 822 in the hymnal, number 822. Titus 3, 4. 
the kindness and love of our God appear. <clears throat> Here we go. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day, day I will never forget. After I wandered in darkness away, Jesus, my Savior, I met. Oh, what a tender, compassionate friend, he met the need of my heart. Shadows dispelling with joy, I telling he made all the darkness depart. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When
on the first day of the week when we were gathered together to break bread Paul began talking to them in the early times they were doing what we're doing today so some 2,000 years ago they were breaking bread and this is not solely about the sacrifice on the cross nor solely about what follows thereafter he's placed in the grave but his rising again in the stone being rolled away it's all of those things but what Jesus asked us to do is to remember gravestones allow us to remember but all the gravestones I've seen have not been rolled away and someday for us when we're gone there is also that promise of the gravestone will be rolled away we will be just as eternal as Christ himself he through his sacrifice provided eternal life so allow me to read from Matthew now when evening came Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve disciples and they were eating he said truly I say to you that one of you will betray me being deeply grieved they each one began to say to him surely not I Lord and he answered he who dipped his hand with me in the bowl is the one who will betray me the Son of Man is to go just as it is written of him but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed it would have been good for that man if he had not been born and Judas who was betraying him said surely it is not I rabbi Jesus said to him you have said it yourself while they were eating Jesus took some bread and after a blessing he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said take eat this is my body and when he had taken the cup and given thanks he gave it to them saying drink from it all of you for this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins but I say to you I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom for this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins and that's made very clear in Acts 238 repent and be immersed every one of you for the remission of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit so now is the time to think of but one thing and that is Jesus as Savior his body his blood will you pray with me our Father in heaven we are so very grateful 
for what you gave your son to do even before the foundation of the world. That the plan was to save mankind who would agree to be adopted into your family even before the foundation of the world that was the plan the greatest plan ever made and for this bread O oh father which Jesus said represents his body and all that it went through for us we do give thanks in his name, Jesus. Amen. If you read Leviticus, you will read in the first many chapters of all of the kinds of sacrifices that were given during the Old Testament dispensation during that time. The blood that we recognize now is not for a sin. It's for the beginning all the way from Adam all the way to the end of the earth. That complete. And not a bird or a bull or a goat or a lamb for each individual kind of transgression. But once and for all. All who would do exactly what our minister was talking about all who would follow him and this blood has such efficacy that if everybody on the planet now all almost 8 billion of us would agree those who could believe would agree could save all them and all who were on the planet before and after but we have to agree to follow him. And he has the adoption steps. They're made very clear, and they were made clear at the end of the sermon today. Will you bow with me as we give thanks for the blood? Our Father in heaven, we give thanks on this, the first day of the week, the Lord's Day, for the blood of Jesus, Yeshua, Messiah, Christ, who died for us, all would, who would agree to follow him. In Jesus we do give thanks for this, and amen.